Okay, we are uh, uh, ready for the next talk, so everybody please take a seat. Okay. So, Martin, are you also ready? Uh, yeah, okay. do you hear me? Very well. So, um, we can continue with the second talk of uh, Martin Heider. Please go ahead. Thanks. <clears throat> okay, uh, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so if you remember yesterday, we stopped, well, we started discussing kind of gauge theories, and um, we saw that an important ingredient there is are these connections, A, which we called A, um, and we sort of ended on an exercise which was to figure out how A should transform under the action of the gauge group uh, so that the uh, covariant derivative, uh, which we defined yesterday, transforms in the correct way, in the sense that if phi is a function that sort of transforms in the natural way under the action of the gauge group, um, that its covariant derivative also transforms in the natural way, which is just pointwise multiplication. Um, and actually, if you, <clears throat> if you did the calculation, um, then what you find out is that the uh, transformed G is just given by conjugation, which you would expect. So that's the natural pointwise action somehow of the gauge group on the Lie algebra. Um, but then there's an extra term, which is actually the uh, differential of G times G inverse. I mean, that's just, you know, whatever you need so that the differential, which is the tangent space at G, uh, gets back to the tangent space at the origin. And so this is again an element of the Lie algebra. All right, so, so this shows that these connections, we view them as one forms with values in the Lie algebra, but they don't actually transform as one forms, right? So regular one forms would actually just transform like this. Uh, under the action of the gauge group. Okay, so this additional term is just some leftover of the fact that the A is really a connection and not a one form, even though in the way it's described, for example, in local coordinates, it looks the same as a one form. Um, okay, so now before we go to actually define Young Mills theory, we need one last ingredient which is uh, given such a connection A, we need to define the curvature of a connection. Um, and so the intuition, let me try to just explain the intuition of what the curvature is. Um, basically what you do, so remember the setting is you have your sort of underlying space time, which is just some copy of RD. Uh, and then at every point you have a fiber, uh, which is a copy of G. Um, and then the connection A gives you a notion of horizontal lift, which is if you have a, if you're given a curve down on the base space so on RD here, um, and you're given say a starting point up here, on the fiber uh, at the starting point of the curve, then the uh, A gives you a notion of horizontal lift. So you can uh, kind of lift this curve to the, to the full bundle. But one property of this lift is that it doesn't necessarily, um, so when you perform a loop, a closed loop downstairs, Upstairs, when you lift it, it doesn't necessarily get back to where you started, right? So you can have a situation where you take a curve uh, which forms a closed loop down in RD, and now you lift it to a horizontal curve in the, uh, in the bundle uh, via this connection A. Uh, and in general, there's no reason by the time you come back to the starting point, that the horizontal lift of your curve actually closes up, right? So you might actually end up here instead of ending up here. Um, and the curvature of A, 
just measures by how much a some, somehow these closed curves don't close up locally. Right? So what you do, the idea is now what you do is you take an infinitesimal. So you take a very small curve, right? Instead of taking an order one closed loop, you take an infinitesimally small closed loop, and then you take the horizontal lift of that. And of course, to first order, it's going to close up. Uh, and then you look at the second order term. Um, and the second order term is in general not going to be zero, so second order in the diameter of the loop. Um, and then you give that a name, and that's you define this as the curvature. So if you want more precisely, what you do is you choose um, two coordinate direction, for example. So you take the so you have the direction xi and xj. Um, and then given, you know, two coordinate directions, you do a little loop, you perform a little loop like that, where of size epsilon, right? So you go, you go around like this. Um, and you look at what the horizontal lift, what's the action, um, I mean, what's the horizontal lift of this little curve uh, under the connection A? And so what is it going to be? Um, well, basically what you do is you have to multiply, right? So you, you basically just look at first, what does it do on this little segment? Then what does it do on this little segment, et cetera? Um, and on each little segment um, to second order, the effect in local coordinates of the uh, of the connection is to actually so if you look at right so if I identify all the fibers so locally I can identify all the fibers with a copy of G and so I just look at the motion up in the fiber um, and the motion up in the fiber when the when the base point moves along a little segment is basically going to be to first order e to the epsilon times a evaluated at the midpoint uh, of the segment. So if say here I have a base point X, then it would be X plus epsilon over two EI. Okay, and this is kind of important because, well, of course, if I don't include this term, that only gives me an epsilon square effect, but I precisely want to figure out what the epsilon square effect is at the end. Okay, so I'm not allowed to, um, I can disregard sort of all the epsilon cube effects, but I'm not allowed to disregard all the epsilon square effects. Right, so that would be the motion up in the fiber when I move by a little uh, amount epsilon horizontally in the direction i. Um, and then, okay, so I just multiply, right? So now we perform, we look, uh, sorry, so here there's ai. So and now we move in the direction j. So we have a j, except that now it's not at x, but it's at x plus epsilon e i plus epsilon over two e j, right? And then we have an e to the, so now for the third segment, we move in the opposite direction. Um, so then we get an e to the minus epsilon a i again, and this time it's x plus epsilon over two EI plus epsilon EJ. And then I have a final term, which is E to the minus epsilon AJ again, X plus epsilon over two EJ, right? Um, and now if you do, now that's again, um, a simple exercise using baker kampel hausdorff for example, to first order uh, to figure out, you know, what this actually looks like to order epsilon square. So what you figure, what you find is that to order epsilon, things cancel out, right? Because to order epsilon, you just add up these quantities. Uh, and of course, at order epsilon, this guy is the same as that guy, this guy is the same as that guy, they come with minus signs, so they cancel out, right? So at order epsilon, I get zero, or e to the, you know, epsilon times zero. Um, and so the thing that I want to look at is what happens at order epsilon square.
right? And if you do the calculation, you'll find that at all the epsilon square, here you'll find diaj minus djai, um, right? So this kind of comes from basically, you know, Taylor expanding that guy um, in the second piece, like, and so, right? So in this aj direction and then comparing to this guy, so you see that the, the basic values cancel out, but then the first order gives you a partial derivative. Um, and same for the other one. Um, and then you have an additional terms that come from baker kampel hausdorff and that's just the commutate actually of AI with AJ. <clears throat> and then by definition, if you want, this is e to the epsilon square curvature. So the curvature, and so another way of writing the curvature, if you want, without the coordinates is actually da, right? So you, you will see that this here is actually just the exterior derivative. Um, <clears throat> again, interpreting a as a one form, right? So if a is interpreted as a one form, this is just the exterior derivative of that one form, which gives you a two form. Um, and then this extra term often is written like this. So it's essentially uh, like the exterior product of A with itself, but where multiplication is replaced by a Lie bracket. And the reason why there's a one half here is because if you do multiplication, you would have AIAJ minus AJAI, but AIAJ by itself is already interpreted as the Lie bracket. And so Lie bracket minus Lie bracket with arguments reserved, reversed is just twice the Lie bracket. Whereas here the Lie bracket appears once. And so we have to put a half here. Okay. Um, right, so that's the definition of the curvature and the curvature one can actually check is a proper two form, right? So the connection was not actually a one form in the sense that under changes of coordinates, it doesn't transform like a one form. There's this additional term here. Um, the curvature one can check, this is actually a two form. So this guy, transforms under changes of coordinates or under the action of the gauge group in this way. So just pointwise conjugation with G, okay? So this guy is a genuine two form uh, with values in the Lie algebra. And it tells you, right? So, norm so in the case, right, so the original example that I gave you was the one of, uh, with electromagnetism. So in that particular case, um, the, structural group was just U1, which is abelian. Um, and if it's the structural group is abelian, then this term here always drops. Right? So now if we go back to Young-Mills, Right, so again, we fix G and it's always going to be a compact Lie group. Um, and then we fix also the underlying space, some RD. Um, and now the, uh, the field, right? So Young-Mills is a field theory. So the field in Young-Mills is the connection. So equivariant connection on say Rd times G. Um, and now the action that's associated uh, to this field, so S of A is just given by one half integral of fa of x square dx. Okay, so that's pure Young-Mills. So if you want, that would be the field theory for a vacuum, actually. Right? So then in reality, you would want to add particles to that. Uh, and then it means that you, you add to your Young-Mills um, 
to this connection, you add additional fields that then describe the different types of particles. Uh, but in this lecture series, I'm just going to completely ignore that from a technical from a technical point of view, from the point of view that from the perspective that we are looking at, adding these additional fields doesn't make doesn't give any additional difficulty. Um, it does, however, destroy some of the structure. So depending on your point of view, it does make a difference. Uh, from our point of view, it doesn't make much difference, and so I'm going to ignore them. So the action is just the L2 norm of the curvature, right? So, so remember, uh, in the um, at the very beginning, I told you that the prototypical example of an action that you should have in mind is, well, you take a field and you just take the H1 norm square of the field, so the integral of the gradient square, right? So this looks very much like that because we've seen, right? So this uh, FA, this curvature is actually something like a derivative of A. Right? So we have, we have a nice interpretation of what it is, but if you look at the formal expression, it's basically a derivative of A. Right? Um, and so this, in a way, it sort of very much looks like um, this simple example uh, that I mentioned at the very beginning, where the uh, action would just be the uh, L2 norm of the gradient. Um, but the important feature is the following, right? which is that if you take any, for any G in the gauge group, so that means G is a function from RD into G, into the structure group. Right? So always capital G like that is the structure group. So that's the group that you know gives you the fiber at every point. And that's a compact Lie group. And then curly G here is what's called the gauge group. And the gauge group consists of just functions with values in the structure group. Right? So this is an infinite dimensional group. Uh, it's also basic. It's also it's a group just because you know if you have two such functions, you can multiply them pointwise. Right? Since you have a product in G, means you have a pointwise multiplication, so you can actually multiply elements in curly G. So this is a group, uh, but this is infinite dimensional, obviously, because it just consists of all functions with values in G. Um, so if I take an element of the gauge group, then um, the action of AG, well, it's a half integral norm of FAG square. Um, and I just told you that the, um, that the curvature transforms like a two form. And so that means that this is really just a conjugation. But then the norm that we take here Right, so this guy takes values in the Lie algebra, so I didn't actually specify what norm we take here. Uh, the natural norm to take is just any norm which is invariant under conjugation. And such norms always exist in a compact Lie group and they're actually unique up to scalar multiplication. Right? So there's a basically unique up to multiple, there's a unique natural norm here um, and that's the one that we choose. And that natural norm has the property that this quantity here is independent of G. And so that means that this is just S of A again. Right? So, so what you see here is that the action is actually invariant under the action of this gauge group. Right? And so that's one of the main features because of gauge theory, right? So remember the idea is that uh, this is just some sort of coordinate transformation and all physical quantities should be independent of these choice of coordinates, if you want, of this, uh, of this bundle. Um, and therefore it's natural that the action that you want to look at should be independent under changes of coordinates. Okay, so that's a natural property that you want. Um, but from a, 
mathematical point of view, this is going to be problematic, right? Because remember, if the action was something like integral of gradient phi square, then that's a quantity which really kind of grows in all directions in a very nice way. Right? So if you look at, say, the sub-level sets of, or like the unit ball, the H1 unit ball in L2 is compact, at least say, okay, if instead of RD you take a torus, right? so you put yourself in finite volume uh, instead of the whole space, uh, then you have this very strong kind of coercivity properties of H1 norm square. So here, you can't expect to have any nice coercivity property of that action because, well, you know, you have this infinite dimensional group that acts on it, and that infinite in all directions, if you want, in which this infinite dimensional group acts, the action S is constant. Right? So, you, so that at every point, A, there are infinitely many directions that you can move and where you where s looks flat okay. so it's not at all like gradient square which at every point you can move in any direction it actually looks a parabola right? i mean it looks like a parabola with a non-zero curvature and there's really kind of very strong bounds from below um okay so here you have many flat directions um and so now the problem is, well, so remember what we wanted to do in this Euclidean quantum field theory approach is you want to define a measure which should be interpreted as e to the minus s of a, and then here sort of dA, right, where this was supposed to be the bank. Um, and now, well, there's basically no chance for such an expression to actually make sense because this density now is somehow flat in infinitely many directions, right? So then this should look like the bag measure on each orbit of the gauge group curly G, right? So the, the picture here is you have your space, the space of connections. Right? So you have a say a connection A here. Um, and there are these orbits here, which are all the AGs for G in the gauge group, right? That sort of foliate, if you want, your, uh, your space of connections like that. Um, and now you would somehow want to build a measure on this space of connections, which in some informal way can be interpreted as e to the minus the Young-Mills action times Lebesgue measure. But then the Young-Mills action is constant on each of these orbits. And therefore, if such a measure exists, then it should look like Lebesgue measure on each of these orbits. But each of these orbits is still infinite dimensional. Right? And we've seen, oh, you all know uh, that you can't, in general, expect to have something like Lebesgue measure on any infinite dimensional space, right? So Lebesgue measure doesn't exist on infinite dimensional spaces. Uh, and so this, this is implausible that this exists, right? Now, of course, you know, there's something one can do about this. And this is based on the following remark, um, which is of course very standard, which is that you don't really want to actually build a measure 
on the space of connections because all the physical observables, right? So all the physics is supposed to be coordinate independent, right? So it means that your physical state, if you want, of your system is not actually a connection, but it's really the whole orbit, right? So the whole orbit should really be interpreted as one state, right? So different points here on that orbit should just be viewed as different ways of describing the same state, but as actually describing really the same physical state. And so in reality, we don't really care about building a measure on the space of connections. We should really quotient the space of connections by the action of the gauge group and build a measure on the space of gauge orbits. So actually, we want to build a measure on the space of gauge orbits, uh, which is the equivalence classes for, well, the equivalence relation where A is considered to be equivalent to AG for every G in curly G, okay? Um, and so now in that space, right, in the quotient space, in the space of gauge orbits, each of these infinite dimensional orbits here is just a point. And so then that's not, you know, the argument here about there not being any Lebesgue measure in infinite dimension, uh, that argument doesn't apply anymore. So, so you can hope that this functional is kind of sufficiently coercive in the space of gauge orbits, even if it's not coercive on the space of connections. Okay. Um, but of course now, now you have a new problem, right? So the new problem is now how do you describe that space of gauge orbits, right? And so, or what does it mean? How, you know, how do you project this measure sort of on the space of gauge orbits? So of course, one thing you could do is you could try to find you know, some way of parametrizing the gauge orbits, right? So that's called gauge fixing. So gauge fixing, the idea is that you just uh, fix one specific representative in every gauge orbit. Um, and then you hope that that space, you know, still has sort of a nice structure. So maybe it's not going to be, right? So the space of connections, We've seen that they're basically one form, so it's basically a linear space. It's not quite a linear space because the way that they transform is not actually linear, so it's really an affine space. Uh, but it doesn't matter, it behaves very much like a linear space. Um, when you quotient by this equivalence relation, that's obviously not a linear equivalence relation, so that space of gauge orbit is not going to be linear anymore. But you can hope that, well, maybe locally it's still going to be kind of locally going to look like a linear space. Um, and that's true, at least, you know, modular technicalities. Um, the problem is that there isn't a global way of doing that, right? So the, there isn't actually a global way of parametrizing, um, of finding, you know, such representatives in a way that this can be put, you know, into sort of that you can find a diffeomorphism, if you want, between that uh, and a nice linear space. Okay, so that's actually, there are obstructions there, so that's in general not possible. Um, the other problem is, of course, when you, you know, if you project things down, well, since this is not linear, then you start to have to ask yourself, you know, what happens to Lebesgue measure? Right? Um, so, you know, you're in this situation then that you have a, and so this density is constant on each of these orbits. And so whatever representative you choose, you would still, you know, S is a perfectly nice function 
uh, on that space of representatives. Uh, but of course, Lebesgue measure in general does not project down to Lebesgue measure, right? On the kind of, you know, if you have a nonlinear function like that. Um, and then that means that, well, you know, this starts to depend on, I mean, this starts to somehow get very messy. Right? So you don't really want to do that. Uh, so you would want to somehow build that measure on the space of gauge orbits, but by still actually working at the level of connections and not, uh, not having to choose specific representatives uh, in each gauge orbit. Um, now, one thing that you could also try to do, and so this was done in two dimensions in the 90s, and this, this has been extremely successful, uh, is that you can try to guess, if you want, directly what this measure should look like for suitable observables. Right? So you take some physical observable, which is a function from your space of connections into the reals, for example, but which is constant on these gauge orbits. Right? So the physical observables are not supposed to depend on uh, where you are on each of the gauge orbits. And so natural observables are called Wilson loops. observables. Um, and there the idea is what you do is you do exactly uh, what I mentioned earlier, what we did when we computed the curvature of a connection, right, is you take, take your base space, you take a closed loop in your base space, uh, and then you, you lift this to the uh, and to sort of lift this horizontally to the bundle. Um, and then you look at, you know, by how much where you end up differs from where you start. And this amount, right, which is called the holonomy, right, so this here, this quantity um, is called the holonomy of A along the loop gamma. So if I call gamma that closed loop, uh, so that holonomy is essentially independent of um, the choice of coordinate in the sense that the holonomy of a g along gamma is actually just g of zero. Holonomy of a along gamma, g of zero inverse where zero here is the starting point. Right? So the, the starting point of the loop here, I call it zero. Um, and so that means that if you take, if H from, from G to R is a class function. So a class function is a function which is a, uh, invariant under conjugation. So for example, if you think of G as being a matrix group, then an example of class function would be the trace, right? Because the trace of any conjugate of a matrix is equal to the matrix, it's the trace of the matrix itself. Uh, so that's an example of class function. So you take such a class function uh, and then you take a loop and then I write O if you want H gamma of A to be H of the holonomy of A along gamma, right? So that OH gamma now is a function from connections into reals. And that function, because of that property, right? Because on the one hand of this property and the fact that H is a class function, uh, this function is constant on each of these gauge orbits, right? In the sense that if I apply it to A or to AG, I get the same real number, okay? Uh, so that's an example of physical observable. It actually turns out that basically that's all the observables you ever need to look at uh, because you can actually show that you can 
you can recon if you know the values of all these observables, you can actually reconstruct uh, which gauge orbit you're on. Okay, so they are, if you want, it's like an exhaustive set of physical observables. They really allow you to reconstruct your physical state. Um, so that's a nice set of observables. And so you can ask yourself, um, you know, can I actually figure out a priori simply what the distribution, what the joint distribution of all of these observables are right, for under this measure? And so that was done by Sengupta in the 90s. So actually, there's a, people, there's a paper by Gross, King, and Sengupta in the late 80s. They did it in the case where G is abelian. Uh, and then Sengupta in the 90s did it in the case where G is non-abelian. Um, and then Thierry Lévy in the last 15 years or so um, has actually pushed that point of view much further. Uh, but basically, the idea is that in two dimensions, for pure young mills, so this is not true if you start to couple it to additional fields, so pure young mills in two dimensions, you can actually guess the joint distribution of these Wilson loop observables. Right, so that's basically Sengupta uh, and others. Mind is but up until today, um, which is basically in 2D or pure young mills. One can guess the joint. Law of O H I comma I or well, I think maybe H needs to be fixed. Uh, I don't remember. I think maybe H needs to be fixed, but the gammas uh, for any collection, any finite collection. of loops. Okay. Um, I'm not going to give you, it's not really an explicit formula, but uh, it can be written in terms of the um, heat group on G. So the regular finite dimensional heat flow. Okay, so simply solution to the heat equation, uh, starting at the identity with the delta function at the identity uh, on the on the group G. So in terms of that quantity, so in terms of the heat kernel on G, one can actually give basically an explicit formula of this joint distribution. Okay. Um, but that works only in 2D and only for pure young mills. Okay. Um, so, so then there's a number of other, so actually, so this is this joint distribution. There's a paper there's a relatively recent paper by Ilya Shevirev uh, where he shows that you can actually really go back in some sense uh, to connections uh, in the sense that he actually builds, if you want, a space of connections and the probability measure on that space so that that space of connection is sufficiently nice if you want so that uh, these Wilson loop observables make sense. Um, and so that under that probability measure, the joint distribution of the Wilson loops is indeed given by the formula of Sengupta. Okay, so it's possible to sort of go back, of course, not canonically, right? That's obviously not the case. Um, in three and four dimensions, there's much less work, right? So there's a, there's a series of papers by Balaban, uh, Federbush, sort of back in the 80s. Uh, and there's actually even a paper by Manuel Rivasso and Senior, um, which deals with the three, four dimensional case, which of course is the most interesting one, right? Because our physical space time is four dimensional. Um, and they use sort of 
renomization ideas a little bit a la Glim Jaffe uh, to, to build some sort of effective version of this measure. But the, um, okay, so at the end of the day in, that cons in these constructions, it seems very difficult to extract some kind of a clean mathematical statement out of it. Right, so in the sense that it doesn't actually build a probability measure on an actual space of uh, of gauge orbits. Okay, it tells you that certain observables have some limits in some sense, um, but the uh, the precise statements are not very clean. Um, now, there's another approach, which was. Um, actually first proposed by Parisi and Wu, in the 80s. Um, and the idea there is to say, well, if I take, say on, uh, right on Rn, um, if I take a measure of the form mu of dx is equal to e to the minus v of x dx for some nice function v, uh, then this measure is invariant for the diffusion um, dx is equal to minus gradient v of x dt plus dw, or if you want x dot is equal to minus gradient v of x plus xi, where this xi here is white noise. And so you take a stochastic gradient flow, so you basically just look at the gradient flow associated to the potential v, um, then you add some white noise. So this is some type of Glauber dynamic, if you want, for that Gibbs measure. Um, and then you can just check. It's a you know, two-line calculation uh, using Ito's formula. You can check that this measure is invariant for this equation in the sense that if x0 is distributed according to mu, then xt is distributed according to mu for every t. And furthermore, if you start x0 with some other initial condition, then it's actually going to converge to mu for long times. Um, and in particular, mu is actually the only invariant measure for x. Right? So now uh, what Parisi and Wu suggested was to kind of turn that on its head and to say, well, if I want to define such a measure, if you want to build such a measure, I actually really just need to define this noisy gradient flow that's associated to the uh, potential that appears up there. And then I can just define this measure as being the invariant measure for that dynamic. Right? So if I know that this dynamic has an invariant measure and I know that it's unique, then, well, in the finite dimensional case, it has to be that. Um, and therefore, well, if I can do that in the infinite dimensional case, it's not unreasonable to actually just define that measure to be the invariant measure of that you know, stochastic gradient flow. Okay, so that's the idea of Parisian rule. Um, and so if you do this for, in the case of young mills, right, so for young mills, of course, this is all completely formal here. I'm just, you know, closing my eyes, pretend that my space of connections is finite dimensional. Um, here, of course, when you talk about gradient, implicitly it means that you've somehow fixed a metric somewhere, right? Because the uh, the intrinsic way of differentiating v gives you a form, and right? so it gives you an element of the cotangent space. Uh, and here you want an element of the tangent space, so you have to somehow turn cotangent space to tangent space. So you need a metric, uh, and that metric has to be the same. Right? So if you have a noise. It means you need to specify the covariance of that white noise. Um, and that covariance is 
you know, positive definite bilinear form. So it actually also defines a metric. And the two metrics need to be the same. Okay, so there's a compatibility. Implicitly here, when I write this, I had to choose a metric here in order to make sense of the gradient. And I had to choose a metric here in order to specify the covariance of the noise. And the two metrics should be the same. Or actually, maybe if I write things like that, they should differ by a factor two or something. Okay. Um, so here I have to choose a metric first. And I just take the L2 metric. Um, and so then what you find is the following. Uh, so you find something like DTA. Right? So I have to just take the L2 derivative of the gradient of the curvature square in the direction of A. Um, and if I do that, I find out that you get the adjoint here of the covariant derivative acting on F A, and then you have the noise. Right, so you get an equation like this. Um, so here, remember, D A uh, was this covariant derivative. So the covariant derivative takes a one form, gives you a two form. And so the adjoint here takes a two form and gives you a one form. And so the right hand side here is of the correct type, if you Right, so A is a one form with values in the uh, Lie algebra. And so now the noise here should also be a white noise in time with values in one forms with values in the Lie algebra uh, and with covariance structure given by the L2 metric. Okay, and if you actually write that out, you know, what it actually means, it really just means that if you look at the expectation, so Xi, you really have a Xi i um, of x t Xi j of y t y s, if you want, um, right? So it's a one form with values in the Lie algebra. So this guy still takes values in the Lie algebra. Um, and then what you find here is you have a delta ij, delta x minus y, delta t minus s times the Casimir. Okay, so the Casimir viewed as an element of, you know, the universally enveloping algebra and actually a second order element of the universally enveloping algebra, which is just an element of G. Tensor G, symmetric tensor. Okay. Uh, so basically, this is white noise, right? So it's white noise in time, it's white noise in space, components are independent, and the Casimir, you know, in every reasonable way of writing it, it's basically the identity operator as well. Okay. So, so you get this equation here. Um, and so what we're going to see tomorrow is, well, you know, how far can you actually push this idea, right? So now the idea is to say, well, you would want to somehow give a meaning to this equation. Um, and ideally, you know, you would want to well, first define some kind of flow or some kind of solution theory for that equation. You need to find a decent state space. Uh, you need to figure out what you actually mean by a solution to that equation. And then you would want to know, you know, does it have an invariant measure? Is the invariant measure unique? Uh, and if you can do that, then well, that would allow you to actually define the young mills measure. So the bonus question would be even, you know, relate that to the construction of Sengupta and company. Uh, so not all of that is done, right? So we've made some progress in that direction. So some of it we know, some of it we believe, some of it we don't know how to do. Um, this is all joint work, by the way with um, A.J. Chandra and in, from Imperial, uh, Ilya Shevirev from Edinburgh, and Hao Shen from uh, Wisconsin-Madison. Um, OK, so I think maybe this is not a bad place to stop for today.
I don't think I hear you. Thank, can you hear me now? If you're saying something, I don't yes, hear what you're wait saying. Wait a second. So, right. Um, I don't. I don't see the mute button. Ah, now I see it. Okay. Can you hear us now? Yep. yep. Sorry, we we were muted, of course. <laughs> okay. Good. Um, are there questions? Yes, Anton, please. Yeah. Hello, Martin. Thanks for a nice talk. I have just Hi. a short comment about this 2D young news story. So you mentioned some very important players like Singupta and Thierry Levy. Uh, but I think uh, all those expectation values were actually computed in the 70s by the physicist Migdal. And then, of course, on the mass side, on, on the physics side, there were many developments, but the formulas for expectation values of Wilson lines, they date to the 70s and to the work of Migdal. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So there is a question online. What is the operator uh, E on the last slide? Uh, I don't see an operator E now. Uh, I don't see an E. Oh, expectation. Ah, it's the expectation, mean, yes. That's an expectation, yeah. Well, I mean, this is a stochastic equation, so. Okay, so there is another question online. Is there, uh, maybe, I don't know if you, uh, well, I, I, will, I will read it anyway. Uh, is there a Osterwalder Schrader type theorem for the would be invariant measure? Um, so, I, well, I'm not aware of um, someone having written it down, so I think everybody believes. Um, but I'm not sure if someone has actually gone through the motions uh, and you know gone back, even in the case of 2D pure young mills or so. But uh, it's not completely clear because I mean currently. Right, the constructions um, a la Sengupta and company, they just give you these observables for the Wilson loops. Um, so it doesn't quite, it isn't quite somehow formulated in the right way. Yeah. Um, and, and of course that measure that Ilya constructed also is somehow doesn't really, it doesn't have a direct somehow link to the uh, Young Mills action, and so that one probably doesn't has no reason to obey reflection positivity or anything. Uh, so I'm not aware of one, but it, it may well be that somebody did something, but it's not that I know. Okay, thanks for the answer. Are there more questions here on site? If not, we can thank uh, again uh, Martin. For the on-site participants, let me remind you that we have this COVID testing booth if you need a test until 2 o'clock today. There is no booth tomorrow, so if you need it, you can, also, you can have it today. There will be a booth again at ICMP on Monday. And so. Okay, thanks.